G'day, Internet. Kale from Vesa here, taking you into the Vesaverse. And today, it's a very special episode. We're going to chat about Vesa for Okta, how you can use Vesa to get even more value out of your identity provider by connecting authentication to granular authorization. And I'm joined today by Roger Renicki, a solutions architect here at Vesa. Roger, how are you? I'm doing well, Kale. I'm looking awesome. forward to the discussion today. Excellent. So we'll get to Okta in a moment, but first, for those of you who don't know us yet, let's quickly talk about what Vesa is. Now, Vesa is the identity first security platform for data, and it's built to help you answer a simple but very important question. Who can and should perform what action on what data? So Roger, maybe a good place to start is how do a platform like Vesa and an identity provider like Okta fit together? Sure, Kel. So when it comes to understanding and controlling authorization to data, OctaGit can be an important piece of the puzzle, but by itself, it can't completely answer the question of who can perform what action on what data. Mm -hmm. So Okta does a good job for solving, uh, solving for authentication of users and provisioning mm -hmm. at a high level through groups, for example. But to understand a user's permissions to an individual re data resource, a Snowflake table, an S3 bucket, or a GitHub repository, for mm -hmm. example, you need additional metadata that can come from your cloud providers and your databases, for example. Mm -hmm. So here at Vesa, we recognize a universal model for cloud permissions that traverses users, groups, roles, policies, permissions, and finally the data assets themselves. Platforms like Okta are primarily concerned with the first two, users and groups. Right, and additionally, there's always going to be identities that are out of scope for an IDP like Okta, right? Yeah, there can be other paths to access that don't go through Okta, like local accounts or service accounts that are difficult to control with Okta alone. Absolutely. So let's look at some of the potential risks that can come up here. So one is that you're provisioning based on groups, but those groups may not accurately reflect the true access that members get. Yeah, that's right. So group names are often very generic or they reflect a broad role, something like marketing or finance. So the person doing the provisioning may not fully understand all the granular permissions that come with the group. This can be a path to excess privilege. Mm -hmm. And sometimes people even name uh, groups um, explicitly like, you know, read only for data resource X. But over time, they've uh, come to have write or delete permissions. And we see a lot of this when we actually implement Phaser. Absolutely. So in turn, you know, some of the safeguards that you can apply in Okta, like requiring multi-factor authentication for certain groups, they may not completely protect the assets that they're meant to cover. Yes, that can definitely happen. So it's something that Vesa automatically looks for, and we'll demo this in a minute. Um, you'll find that even where there are MFA requirements set up in Okta for seven groups, there may still be identities that don't have MFA configured, but can perform privileged actions. Right, and as you mentioned before, there might be ways to access sensitive data that circumvent the identity platform altogether. Yeah, and again, I'll show you how we surface those identities. For example, it can be users who have left or changed roles. Mm -hmm. Their access to Okta has been removed, but they still have local accounts in Snowflake and GitHub, for example. Okay, so Roger, you're going to show us what we can do when we combine Okta and Vesa. But just quickly to cover how Vesa works, right? Uh, Vesa uses an you know, agentless, read-only API access to ingest metadata, not just from an identity pro provider like Okta, but also your cloud providers and all the actual data resources themselves, databases, cloud storage, SaaS apps. And we pass all of that metadata and we normalize it into our canonical object model. It's one schema to describe effective permissions to data. And that model drives our authorization graph and lets us query all data permissions across your stack. And with that information, you can develop insights into your access trends. You can surface violations of best practices. You can create workflows for governance and compliance. And you can automate the first steps of remediation by integrating with ITSM, with notification tools, Slack, ServiceNow, even something like Okta workflows. So uh, Roger, take us in. Thank you, Kale. Let me jump right into it. So the first thing I'll be showing you is who has access to my Snowflake tables. And in this view, I'm going to select the customer table over here. And I'm going to say, show me identities with any permissions. And here we can see very clearly that I have one Okta user called Sharon Wood in the marketing group that has access to this customer table. But also we can see the path here, like how is Sharon accessing that? So clearly in the Okta group marketing, also mapped to a local Sharon Wood account within Snowflake, 
I see the snowflake role she's in, which is also marketing. Um, and then I can see what her effective permissions are. And really effective permissions is the way we Vasa standardizes the permissions into human readable form. So CRUD format, create, read, update, and delete. If I were to look and explain this effective permissions, I can see that the actual permissions are things like delete, insert, ownership, and rebuild, for example. But again, what does that mean um, in human readable form? It means the user can create, write, delete, they have read access, they can make action, uh, take actions against metadata, and they also have non-data um, actions that they can perform as well. Now, what I can do here is within the graph, I can certainly go back and look in time and see how this graph has changed. Maybe Sharon's access has changed over time. Mm -hmm. I can also, for example, take a screenshot and send this over to a service desk or a help desk in case they're wondering, you know, how, what's the path to actually access mm -hmm. the Snowflake table called customer, for example. So the other thing I, I can do is I can, um, you know, look at certain violations here, right? And we mentioned um, earlier about MFA. So here we can see that Sharon, for example, um, does not have MFA enabled. And that's very easy to see if I look at her attributes on her profile um, here where it says MFA active is false, mm -hmm. right? So again, very rich, very granular level of data that we can pull into VASA from all these different providers. Mm -hmm. So we're getting this stuff uh, from Okta and we can combine that with the metadata that we get from, from Snowflake or from AWS or anywhere else. And that's what we use to create these rich queries. Awesome. So this is a, a, a sort of view that's focused on a particular resource, in this case, a Snowflake table. But we can also look at this from the other way around and look at the position, the permissions of an Okta user, right? Absolutely. Let me bring that up right now. So what are we going to do is look at this user called Gary Ward, mm -hmm. who is an Okta Ooh. user specifically. Yeah. And then what we see is at a very granular level, all the accesses that Gary has. So not only Okta, we can see that Gary also has an Azure AD user over here. Mm -hmm. Gary is a part of these Azure and Google Workspace and AD groups. We can see that Gary has membership for all these applications, you know, PagerDuty, GitLab, GitHub, for example. We can also see all the roles assigned uh, to Gary, as well as the policies that apply to him. Um, if I were to show you an example of an effective permission, for example, Google, you can see that this, even though it's different on the Google side, we've once again distilled that into the CRUD format here as well, right? And so now it becomes very easy if I were to say, okay, how is Gary accessing my Sigma Finance S3 buckets? Mm -hmm. I have a very easy path back to follow and say, you know, Gary has these permissions via these roles and because of these groups. So very easy uh, to get that level of question answered. What does my user actually have access to? Right. And to be clear here, we're not saying that provisioning through groups isn't effective. Clearly it is. But, you know, what we're seeing here is, as you say, the true granular permissions of the user as they are now, you know, not at design time or what you think they are, you know, when you're doing this. So we can validate, you know, the accuracy and the effectiveness of the provisioning that we're doing through Okta. And we can see any gaps uh, and how permissions might come from other ways. So there's a lot here, Roger. So can, this is this is uh, can we can we sort of zoom in on a, a more specific uh, you know issue that I might be interested in, say the relationship of you know local accounts to Okta accounts. Yeah, absolutely. And for that, we have the query builder, right? And so over here, what I'll do is I will search for example a Snowflake local user, mm. and this is showing all the Snowflake users, right? Some of them may be assigned to an Okta account, and so mm. that's the next thing I'm going to type in here. You know, group by Okta users. Um, and then you can see that, you know, Sharon Wood's local Snowflake account mm -hmm. is mapped to an Okta user. But that's not the question you asked, Mikhail. You, you want mm -hmm. the opposite. And so we can mm -hmm. do the has no relation to, and we can see these are the accounts that actually don't have Okta users. Mm -hmm. And if you look at these first few over here, I think it's fairly easy to, dis to determine that these are uh, service accounts. You still want to mm -hmm. look at that, obviously, to make sure. But the bottom two here, Thomas and Willie, you can see that they clearly are not service accounts since they have an email in there. So maybe what's happened here is maybe, um, you know, their account got disabled in Okta, maybe even removed, but but somehow there's lingering access, some provisioning job failed. And so this is a easy way for us to actually highlight those discrepancies within the systems. Absolutely. And from here, we can investigate and clean up. So we've seen that we can get very specific, but now we can also surface, you know, general trends for Okta usage, right? And track best practices that are going to be relevant to everybody. Yeah, that's right. So if I go to our reporting uh, section mm -hmm. here, 
Um, as you can see, since we're talking about Arctia, I can simply jump into that, but this is a single pane of glass for all the other systems as well, right? So, so getting into Arctia, for example, we can see that we have nine Arctia groups that don't have any users in them. And so that could be an opportunity to clean up, go and investigate and find out why do I have these groups? Maybe I should delete those groups, right? So there's opportunity to do Arctia cleanup um, uh, with um, information that Vesa is highlighting mm. as well. Uh, the other piece that's very interesting as well is obviously the cross-platform um, mm. access. So if we look at, for example, after users with Redshift drop privileges, that's specific privilege, right? I can mm. see I have three users there. I can see how this changes over time there. But more importantly, I can actually create a rule around this. And I can say, if that um, query results change, you know, based on VASA scanning the environment, um, mm constantly alert me um, and that alert can take um, you know many forms but we'll talk about after workflow since mm -hmm. we, this is a, a you know discussion around after we can connect you after workflows and we can send the payload of information of what mm -hmm. those new users were and so after can take action on that essentially remove the user if that's what you need to do Absolutely. So this is taking things that we know are important to us. And it's not just that we can go and explore these at any point in time. Uh, you know, we've defined these rules and VASA is constantly monitoring the environment. And if these things change, whether it's via Okta provisioning or via another path, uh, we're being alerted and we can automate those first steps of remediation. Awesome. Thanks, Roger. So just trying to sum up some of what we've shown you here today, you can see that by combining Okta and VASA, some of the things you're able to do, we're able to validate the accuracy and effectiveness of the provisioning that you're doing in Okta. We're able to you know, surface uh, identities that are circumventing Okta provisioning, and we're able to identify and remediate common misconfigurations like inactive accounts, orphaned accounts. Uh, so Roger, thanks very much for joining us today, everybody. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.